please join me for the prayer of illumination. O brilliant God, bring your word to us as a light on our paths of understanding and grace. Help us internalize the power of the scriptures by what they mean, becoming light for this beautiful and broken world in a million different ways. Amen. The first reading comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. In heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Our second reading this morning comes from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Listen now for the word of God. The word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts shall be called the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall sit again in the streets of Jerusalem, each with a staff in hand because of their great age. And the boys in the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, even though it seems impossible to the remnant of this people in these days, should it also seem impossible to me, says the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to live in Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God, in faithfulness and in righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you that have recently been hearing these words from the mouths of the prophets, who were present when the foundation was laid for the rebuilding of the temple, the house of the Lord of hosts. For before those days there were no wages for people or for animals, nor was there any safety from the foe for those who went out or came in. And I set them all against one another. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. For there shall be a sowing of peace, The vine shall yield its fruit, the ground shall give its produce, and the sky shall give their dew. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Just as you have been a cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you, and you shall be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God.
Last week, I visited my 29-year-old niece who is being treated for leukemia in North Carolina. I went because I simply needed to hug her, to be present in the midst of all the tests and the chemo and the waiting. My sister and I traveled together and shared a bed just like we did as children. Just after we had fallen asleep one evening, my phone rang and I immediately panicked, knowing that the hour was too late for simply a friendly call. It was my husband letting me know that our 18-year-old daughter was stranded in South Haven with car problems, and he was on his way to get her. Being far away and unable to help, I immediately began to pray for safety and comfort, and I asked my sister to do the same. Unable to sleep, restless, and trying to keep worry at bay, we stumbled into playing the game that we had invented as children, or at least I think we invented it. The game goes like this. The first player makes up the titles of two songs on the fly and offers them to the second player to choose between. The second player chooses the title that sounds the most interesting to them, and the first player makes up a song to fit that title on the spot. Then they switch places, and the second player has to make up the titles and the song. We began to play this game, quickly dissolving into belly laughs so intense that my abdominal muscles hurt the next, next morning. The thing with this game is we don't play for a score or any sort of judgment, but just to entertain one another in a moment that feels scary and helpless just as we had as little girls sharing a big bed. The world is not as safe as we want it to be, and things beyond our control happen all the time. And sometimes all we can do is laugh and be silly together in the face of it. Sometimes it is imagining better carefree days ahead that allows us to get through whatever trials we face. I'd guess that this is what the Israelites might have felt when they read the words from the prophet Zechariah. Words that promised peace and joy and a sense of freedom from burden. A time in the future when the trials created by the exile would be over and people could get their lives back to normal. According to Bible scholars, Zechariah spoke words of hope for the temple to be rebuilt to a community that had been purified through the process of exile and the coming of the messianic age. The images contained in the prophet's book, at least chapters 1 through 8, follow a specific pattern, a series of night visions, each of which is followed by a question and an answer. As the reader, we see that Zechariah is trying to make sense of the chaos and trauma he finds, and trying to understand where the people of Israel are in, are in all of it, and indeed where God is in all of it. Zechariah is considered a lesser prophet compared to those like Isaiah and Jeremiah. And indeed, we rarely hear texts read from this book during worship apart from the portion of chapter 9 that has traditionally been understood as a prophecy for Jesus. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is a standard Christmas text. But the book of Zechariah is far more than just those few verses. In chapter 1, God is understood to contain both anger and tender words of mercy, a combination that we can easily dismiss, but a combination that seems unbelievably real to me. Surely God sees the cruelty we do to one another, 
and knows the depth of our disobedience to divine will. And yet, and yet, God loves us and envisions a better world for us. We see both of these truths explored in the book of Zechariah. The vision of old people sitting in the streets and children playing there is an image that is so specific and easy to grasp, an idea of what the redeemed world could look like if humans would do our part. Inherent in this vision is a lack of conflict and a beautiful expression of community, with all generations present in different but harmonious ways. It's not hard to go from the words of this prophecy that is thousands of years old and imagine summertime in my childhood neighborhood, with kids playing games like hide-and-go-seek, ghosts in the graveyard, and capture the flag together until the streetlights came on, all while the adults sat and visited on front porches with glasses of iced tea or listened to Ernie Harwell's warm and familiar voice calling the Tigers game. I realize this rendering of memory could sound so idyllic that it's false, but I really think many a summer evening was spent that way on the Campbell Street of my youth. Daytimes were lazier but similar, with pickup games of baseball, imaginary play in the backyard, and the highly anticipated sound of the ice cream truck. This leads, to me, leads me to consider the enormous change that we experience going from child to adult. Sure, I'll give you that with adulthood comes the freedom to eat chocolate for breakfast or read past our bedtime, but doesn't it come with a lot of extra responsibilities too? You may have seen the quote on posters and signs, don't grow up, it's a trap. Adulthood means things like paying bills, scheduling appointments, budgeting finances, making dinner, and washing sheets. Not the stuff of fantasy, to be sure. But could it be that our adult lives just need a bit of inspiration? Both from children and the way they operate in their daily lives, and from Zechariah's vision of what a whole and happy community looks like. The vision for the post-exilic community did not just mean faithful living, but according to Zechariah, it meant joyful living, free from the violence of war. The streets were no longer a place of conflict and danger, but had become a place of welcome and play. What does this mean for us today, when for so many, the streets pose more concern than celebration? Where an imagined society for young and old alike has fallen short? As rising health costs mean that the leading cause for families to live on the streets is foreclosure due to medical debt. Gun violence in homes and schools is a daily news story and neighborhoods look confusing and different to folks who have lived there for 60 years or more. Humanity has always known worry and struggle at time, and times have changed. That's not new. But it might be that the epidemic of busyness is worse than ever before. The double-edged sword of technology means that we can be available for work tasks every hour of every day except when we sleep. There are so many kid activities for families to choose from that we might find it hard to fit in dinner together. Our individual plates may be so overly full between work, caring for a loved one, and housework that free time may seem non-existent. And this is really bad news. Because having fun with absolutely no goal in mind might be one of the most central needs for our mental and spiritual health, no matter our income or family structure. 
central to Christian faith and the Reformed tradition, we believe that we have been saved by grace alone. But the ways that we allow fear to govern us, sometimes you'd never know that fact. Instead of meeting this glorious world with unbridled awe and wonder, we very often face it feeling as though we aren't good enough for it that we haven't done enough, or achieved enough, or accumulated enough. The tragedy of this is that our beautiful world, filled to the brim with joys and delights, is like a love poem handed from God to us. And we may be so busy stewing in feelings of inadequacy or disconnected entirely, that we have failed to notice. This sacred earth is a gift, not only to be honored and preserved, but it's also a place in which to find joy and laughter together. And maybe that's the catch. We so often consider the world and the wonder we create here to be territory to conquer instead of the enormous privilege of finding creative ways to share it, tend it, and play in it together. We're pretty comfortable with the goodness of children at play, but there is a tremendous amount of research that suggests that play is important for adults, too. Clinical psychologist and chief of the Division of Psychology at Ellis Hospital Dr. Rudy Nidegger says that there are two basic tenets of play. First, it is something that we do for recreation that is purely for enjoyment and or entertainment. It is something we do just for fun. Second, it is something that is intrinsically motivating. In other words, it is something that we want to do and it is not something we need to be coerced or, or bribed into doing. It is voluntary. We do it just because we want to. This definition sounds an awful like what a spiritual practice should be. Spiritual practices are done as a response to God's grace, not as an obligation, not as a guilt offering. Spiritual practices are expressions of joy and devotion, and for the purpose of that alone, with no goal, deadline, or finished product in mind. Brain research shows clearly that spiritual practices such as prayer lower blood pressure, lessen anxiety, and build creativity. And play has been demonstrated to do the same thing. I can't imagine that God created us for drudgery. And it seems like the waste of an exquisite gift to approach our lives in a humorless ring of work, eat, sleep, repeat. As we consider how to respond to God with love and gratitude for the gracious gifts we know, it might help us to remember Zechariah's image of the children playing in the streets and the old people sitting there with them. Our playfulness, whether a morning run or a bike ride, playing fetch or snuggling with our dog, a drive for ice cream with a convertible top down, singing along with gusto to the car radio, doodling in a notebook, accepting pretend cookies from a child at a tea party, or splashing around in Lake Michigan. These all demonstrate thanksgiving, an offering of praise to the one who formed us and loves us. These offerings are celebrations of being uniquely human. As professor of developmental psychology at New York University, Catherine Tamis Lamanda has written, that's what's really cool about children. They don't worry about the future. They don't check things off to-do lists. They live in the moment. 
There doesn't have to be a final goal, and they play for the sake of play. The truth is, play is being joyfully immersed in the moment. And as adults, we rarely do that. I can't think of any better way to praise our God and follow our greatest teacher than to be joyfully immersed in the moment. Whether he was turning water into wine, talking with the woman who touched the hem of his garment, or sitting in the upper room explaining what was to come with the disciples, isn't joyfully immersed in the moment Jesus in a nutshell? Even though he knew what the future held, his attention was where his feet were planted, and he was intentional about sharing time and space with people, whether they were disciples, a woman with a hemorrhage, religious leaders, or tax collectors. He encouraged us, it's in the Bible, to become like little children, geniuses of playfulness. And if our Protestant work ethic begins to take over, my friends, and we just can't find the time for fun, let's remind one another that play actually makes adults more creative and productive in the long run. Whether it's home tasks, work projects, or commitments to social justice and alleviating human suffering, we can do better with greater resiliency when we know how to take a break for fun. As John Muir said, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in. Everybody means adults too. The feast that we see before us today, this is not a feast of monotony or drudgery. It's not a ritual of going through the motions, but a beautifully prepared banquet that both celebrates this moment and gives us a foretaste of the kingdom. While there can be a solemn component to it, let us not forget that this is also a prime opportunity to be fully immersed in the moment. Sharing this table is not just another job for us to do. It's a sacrament for us to joyfully share. We think a lot about what we need to teach children, but today, let us be reminded of what we have to learn from them. Finding joy and pleasure in playful pursuits for absolutely no purpose at all. So, belly laugh whenever you can. Try a new recipe or a different genre of literature with no fear of failure. Create something just because you can. Watch the Women's World Cup soccer match today and see why some call it the beautiful game. Skip, jump, hopscotch, or dance your way down the aisle to your favorite song, whatever your ability. Chat with people you love about the utter silliness of life. Sit on your porch or hold the hand of a child and admire all of the fireflies in the hush of the evening. Release that big breath of worry that you've been holding on to and let all of your senses enjoy a garden of flowers. We do all of this as joyful people of gratitude who are leaving the blandness of life behind and reclaiming their salty flavor, letting their light shine brighter than any of the 4th of July fireworks display. Hide that kind of light under a bushel? No. Amen.